morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Secure Your Journey to the Cloud. I'm Liz Fox, Senior Marketing Events Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be part of today's event. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Our speakers will remain on the line to answer questions at the conclusion of the webinar. All video and today's demo will stream through the media player. If you would like to increase the size of the video, you may do so by clicking on the corner of the media player widget. Finally, after today's event, we'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand webinar should you wish to revisit the presentation. So now let's go over today's agenda. First, Stephen Wood, Product Manager at Tripwire, will give a presentation on how to secure your journey to the cloud. Next, we'll have Brent Holder, Senior Technical Product Manager at Tripwire, demo Tripwire Configuration Manager. Finally, we'll have a Q&A with Stephen and Brent, moderated by Mitch Parker, Strategic Account Manager at Tripwire. So now, without further delay, I will turn it over to Stephen Wood. Good morning, good afternoon. Glad you could all make it. Um, so since we're at the top of the hour, let's go ahead and dive straight in and uh, get to the topic. Um, all of you are clearly beginning to move into the cloud and you're part of a mass migration, if you will. Um, as you can see from this uh, statistic from uh, 2020, we're about halfway through what we expect to be the migration to the cloud as workloads and infrastructure begin to make that uh, transition. And right now we've got $300 billion worth of activity uh, in that space. Now, all of that movement is causing uh, Let's just say a lot of confusion, a lot of difficulty uh, in the progression. Uh, it's as if we're in the middle of a great stampede and not necessarily sure that we've all got it right, but we're following the path. Now, what we're here for today is to try to help you uh, along this migration uh, to start making the transition into the cloud a little more safely. Uh, it's easy maybe even too easy to get into the cloud, uh, but we uh, want to make sure that as you do it, you don't expose your companies to a lot of uh, uh, additional risk. And so that's the thrust of today's meeting, to to deal with the, uh, uh, the, the newbies to the cloud uh, that may make simple mistakes, that may uh, get themselves into trouble by not completely understanding what their uh, 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 range of options are, the range of risks are. Uh, and so that's what we wanted to talk about today. And then uh, Brent's going to, ask, as soon as I finish this uh, uh, brief uh, presentation, uh, Brent's going to give a demonstration of a product that we've specifically designed uh, to address some of the problems about moving to the cloud for your first time. And so without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive into uh, uh, the meat of the material. Um, you've probably, if you've done your homework, seen the question of who's responsible for the cloud presented any number of times. And despite that fact, the message is probably not getting across as well as we would like. Uh, you know, looking at the statistics right here, you can pretty well see that 64% of customers believe that the cloud providers are responsible for protecting customer data. 61% believe they're responsible for protecting applications, and 60% believe they're uh, responsible for protecting operating systems. That's not true. You have a lot more responsibility than you would imagine. And it's a really good idea to have a clear vision of where the line is for what you're responsible for versus what they're responsible for. And there's a very simple way to uh, think about this. Now, what I've done is uh, popped a, an AWS uh, diagram about shared responsibility in the middle. Ignore that. Uh, let me give you something that's a whole lot easier to remember. Um, CSPs, the cloud providers, are responsible for everything that was there before you touched it. Um, this is being, they're responsible for the security of the cloud. Your responsibilities are for everything that you do in the cloud. Uh, anything that you bring, anything that you uh, configure, and anything that you make, data, uh, configuring cloud uh, accounts, uh, uh, if you inject uh, 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 virtual machines, things like that. Anything of that category 
that you have done to change the, the raw infrastructure. That's your responsibility. Uh, uh, AWS, uh, Azure, they have uh, no responsibility for anything you've done in that case. So you need to understand, one, where's the line of what I'm responsible for, and then we can start talking about, in your section, uh, what do you need to do to make sure that you are as secure as possible. Now, what I've done in this presentation is to try to break it up into, you know, major questions. Uh, you know, what specific problems are uh, you going to be responsible for dealing with? What uh, problems are you likely to encounter, uh, even if they're not explicitly, uh, you know, a technical question? Uh, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a feel for, you know, what things uh, uh, should you be worried about in the cloud? And uh, along with that, what we'll do is we'll also inject some information about what have we done uh, in terms of uh, our configuration management product which is the product we've focused on uh, new entrants into the cloud uh, to try to alleviate those problems for you. Okay, so the first problem, you've got an account, you've signed up, you've somehow given them the corporate credit card, uh, you've got an account and you now need to configure the account to make sure that it is securely uh, 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 contained so that uh, uh, you've got the basic mechanics in place. Now, that's a very non-trivial exercise, and I've put up these two panels to give you sort of a feel for just how non-trivial it can be. Uh, if you look on the left-hand side, uh, 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 Amazon Web Services, if they're properly configured, have approximately 45 different configuration options that uh, you should be dealing with. And on the right-hand side, Azure, uh, they have 111 configuration options. So you if you make subtle mistakes on these things, you can get into a lot of trouble. So there's not a whole lot of room for error here. Now, uh, one of the things that we, uh, um, uh, you also should be paying attention to is the fact that most companies, when they move into the cloud, and, uh, and I mean somewhere north of 85% of companies, have a multi-cloud strategy. That is to say that they don't want to be locked into just Azure, so they will have some of their business in AWS and some of it with Google as well. Uh, so the difficulties associated with having multiple uh, uh, cloud suppliers is that uh, now you have to have people who are trained on each of those, and they're more likely to make mistakes because they're switching back and forth uh, between the different environments. Now, what we've done to try to address that uh, is we measure the configuration of your accounts against uh, the CIS frameworks. Now, uh, uh, the Center for Information Security is doing something kind of unique, and that is uh, unlike NIST, unlike HIPAA or any of the other frameworks, they're very prescriptive about uh, uh, what you should be doing. They don't leave a lot of room for interpretation. Uh, the other frameworks intentionally design their uh, uh, requirements or recommendations to be rather uh, vague so that there's room for interpretation so that you won't have to change it much uh, as you move from you know operating system version to operating system version or, or things like that. Uh, so they go for you know, uh, long-term low change rate CIS goes for, no, no, tell me exactly what I need to be doing in AWS with Linux, you know, those type of questions. And so uh, that's why we use the CIS framework uh, uh, to drive it, because they are very specific about uh, when I configure an, uh, an AWS account, exactly what settings should I have here. And so uh, uh, that's the first thing that we've done. And actually, that 85% I said about multiple clouds, uh, 92, sorry, my mistake. So that's the first thing we do. Uh, we make absolutely sure that we're testing uh, against a very uh, prescriptive framework. And when we get a, uh, a misconfiguration, we tell you exactly you know, what's wrong, where it's wrong, and what to do about it. Uh, Brent's going to show you some examples of, uh, of, of how we accomplish this and how we do it in a manner that's uh, uh, pretty simple so that uh, uh, no matter how new your employees are to the environment, they'll be able to execute these things uh, quite effectively. Now, the second major problem that we expect customers to encounter, and we have seen it uh, uh, reported widely in the literature is great. You got it configured correctly the first time. That's excellent. Now you need to keep it that way. 
Um, all of those migrations to the cloud bring with them a host of people that were experts in on-prem uh, technologies. And when they get into the cloud, well, obviously you sent them to training, uh, but they haven't been doing it for the, the five or 10 years that they had been uh, in your previous environment. They're new to the environment. So they're going to make mistakes naturally. You know, They're going to do things that look logical that they didn't know had a security implication. And so part of what you need to be able to do is continue to monitor uh, for uh, uh, errors that are injected into the system. Um, and the UK did an analysis on this, and they, uh, they're at the high end of the estimate range, but they believe that 90% of all the breaches that occur are due to human error. And so in the cloud, as we're moving a lot of new uh, personnel to that location, we need to eliminate as much of the human error as possible. Um, you know, just to give you a sense of you know, the, the size of some of these mistakes as they occur, they're fairly straightforward mistakes. Uh, Equifax, a $1.4 billion uh, uh, slip, um, um, you know, Ericsson 1.23, uh, and the list goes on and on. If you do a quick Google search on things like misconfigured uh, 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 storage location, S3 uh, storage buckets, uh, you will see a raft of uh, examples of where misconfigurations resulted in varying degrees of, of breaches. So finding ways to eliminate the human error, to at least minimize it, is going to be you know, uh, an important part in, in making your transition to the cloud as smooth as possible. Now, one of the things that we do specifically is we've implemented automated enforcement into these systems. Now, it's an option. We never assume that we know more about your installation than you do. What we try to do is give you the tools to do as much as effectively as possible uh, if you choose to use them. Um, so what we've done is we said, when it's safe to do it, uh, uh, and you tell us that we're allowed to do it, we will restore uh, functions back to being in compliance if we ever find them to be out of compliance. Now, we can't do that with everything because sometimes it's not safe to do it with everything. In the case of AWS, we can get about 30% of all of the configuration elements uh, easily restored back to their original uh, uh, setting, their in compliance setting with the CIS frameworks. Uh, in Azure, it's uh, much more amenable to this and 73% of the, the configuration settings can be restored back and, and configured. And Brent's going to show you some good examples of uh, this in progress so that you can see how easy it is to do. Uh, but wherever it's possible, wherever it makes sense in, in your uh, organization, we strongly uh, you know, recommend doing enforcement wherever. Uh, as much as you can offload to the machine, uh, the better off you're going to be. But again, you have to make the decision about what makes sense for your operations. Every network's a little bit different. Okay. So the third one is, is a somewhat non-technical uh, uh, aspect. But one of the things that uh, we know is that uh, there are problems that uh, you will encounter in terms of the limited manpower. Uh, you're moving a lot of new people over. But in addition to that, uh, uh, the number of you know, people who are qualified uh, with security credentials uh, is is much lower than is in demand at this time. You know, one estimate that we saw said uh, the the worldwide will be about two million people short uh, with security credentials uh, relative to what the need is, uh, and we're finding that most enterprises are experiencing that kind of a problem. So one of the things that we're doing here is we're intentionally trying to uh, put in place mechanisms, techniques, uh, to try to minimize the amount of manpower required, uh, to try to take uh, people who do not have security credentials and give them enough information so that they can do the right thing at the time that they need to make the decision, those kinds of uh, uh, opportunities. Now, just to give you an example of how consequential this can be, you know, at an enterprise level, uh, uh, McAfee determined uh, from a survey of a thousand of their uh, customers that uh, their customers were averaging 300, uh, 3,500 misconfiguration events every month. 
So if you do really simple math on that one and you have one dedicated engineer who does nothing but uh, fix those misconfigurations, they have to do it at a rate of about 2.7, uh, uh, one every 2.7 minutes. Um, you know, obviously that's not a very rewarding job. Obviously that's not a sustainable rate. So most companies are going to have, uh, most large companies, enterprise class companies are going to have to have multiple people doing nothing but uh, misconfiguration resets. Um, so we recognize that you know the problem of misconfiguration, even in smaller companies, is going to be a, a significant use of time, actually misuse of time of your employees. And so what we're trying to do is offload that work from them uh, so that uh, they can do more productive and uh, more sophisticated work uh, uh, with their time. So just to give you a sense of some of the things that we have implemented to try to uh, make that limited manpower go as far as possible. One, we've optimized setup. Um, uh, with the, the CM uh, uh, configuration manager uh, uh, package, uh, you can go from out of the box to uh, uh, protecting the system in about five minutes. Um, uh, it basically looks at your existing configuration as a starting point, immediately compares that uh, to the CIS framework recommendations, uh, and uh, gives you answers uh, instantly about uh, you know wh where you're out of uh, configuration, where you're out of alignment with the uh, uh, the standards. Uh, so you're not talking about weeks of setup time. You're not talking about a lot of professional services to try to get you up to speed. It's very quick and very straightforward to get the system up and operating. Operational. Um, I mentioned before enforcement, uh, the automation portion of the system. You know, we detect and, and automate uh, 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 remediation of misconfigurations, uh, and this completely eliminates the manpower aspect for any of those that uh, fall under the enforcement capability. So that's that's a high value uh, item that I like to emphasize. Uh, the third one is prioritization. One of the problems is, especially with new people, if they've got a shopping list of 20 misconfigurations, which one do they work on first? So they have to spend some time trying to figure out what's the important stuff, and they have to use a lot of judgment to, to make that happen. And we're trying to take that out of the equation. You always want your manpower thrown against the things that are the highest risk, uh, the most important problems. And so when we give you a shopping list of thing, of misconfigurations where your, your network is out of alignment, we put them in an order that says, you know, the most highest priority items at the top of the list. And again, Brett will show you that one as well. So that's very useful. And the last thing that we do that we think is, has high value is, you know, on the screens where we tell you there's a misconfiguration, we tell you what's misconfiguration, uh, misconfigured, why it's relevant, uh, you know, what effect it's having on the security. So that we're, what we're trying to do is educate the, uh, the operator uh, while they're doing the work. Uh, we tell we don't just say you know something uh, uh, unintelligible uh, or leave off information. We try to uh, explain to the user exactly why we care, why is it high priority, you know what the, will the impact be, those kinds of uh, details. We try to give them, and if they if they choose to try to do uh, the work manually. Um, we also try to tell them exactly, you know, what the manual intervention should look like. So even if you choose not to use enforcement or we're not uh, or are not able to use enforcement, we'll tell you how to do the work. So uh, uh, we take a lot of steps to do education and to assist along the way. And in doing so, we believe we are able to reduce the amount of manpower necessary uh, to operate the system. So. That's basically the overview of uh, what we've done in terms of uh, 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 Configuration Manager to give you a tool that you can use to get into the uh, cloud as quickly, as painlessly, and with as little risk as possible. Now, Brent has all the exciting parts. He actually gets to, to show you uh, the system in operation. I don't think it's as exciting as you know multiple animals uh, balancing, but it's close. So with that, I'll hand off to Brent. Yeah, thank you. This is definitely my favorite slide on here, um, both because I get to show you how this works and because of that, that lovely image. Uh, thanks for 
setting that up for me here, Stephen. I'll go ahead and share my screen so you can all take a look at what we're talking about. Just takes a moment to load here. All right, so uh, what you should be seeing now is the tripware.io uh, platform, and that's where Configuration Manager lives. It's a SaaS offering, and um, I'm going to be showing you uh, from my account. So there will be a few features that are uh, not yet publicly available that you may see because I have some cheat codes enabled, but uh, we'll take you through setting up an AWS account, um, how quickly that goes, uh, what scanning it looks like, what those results are, and I'll walk you through some of the things that Stephen was talking about, like taking a look at um, where you know misconfigurations might be, what options you have for resolving them, using some of that automated enforcement. And so, yeah, let's just jump right in here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new account. I will give this a staggeringly unique name of AWS Demo. And um, so all I really need here is to give this uh, a name. <clears throat> I'm going to use an external connection type. Uh, what that means is I'm going to ask my AWS account to allow tripwire.io to scan it. Um, so I don't need to have any credentials or secrets stored in Tripwire for this scan to work. I'm going to ask my AWS account to allow Tripwire in to do that scanning. And we get to use uh, this really cool feature from Amazon, the Launch Stack, uh, which allows you to bundle up all of the configuration that you need into a CloudFormation template and uh, just kind of automatically get everything in place. Um, there is this checkbox here. I am going to include write permissions for remediation. If I uncheck that, I can do a read-only view of this account and just monitor it. Um, that's really important in cases where the security team and the ops team have like a separation of duties, where you wouldn't want the people monitoring to have the ability to uh, make changes on the account itself. I, I am going to leave that enabled here, but that is an option for you. And we'll go ahead and launch the stack. Uh, this has dropped me into my um, AWS uh, management console. Uh, I was already logged in. Um, this uses single sign-on, so it just drops me right into the create stack. Um, if you don't have that kind of access into AWS or you just log in with the username and password, you'd hit that login page first. Um, we have a few different people testing in this environment, so I'm going to go ahead and reuse a unique name here. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm creating this stack in AWS, and uh, we are noting the um, external ID and AWS account that we're going to allow in. And the level of permission here is set by whether I had that box checked or not. Um, it can be read-only or remediation. We're going to go ahead and leave some of those nifty remediation features available. And because we're creating a role, uh, we, we do just have to acknowledge, yes, I understand I'm, I'm creating a role that, that enables access into my account here. So I'm going to go ahead and create that. And this is where that the power of the launch stack and the uh, CloudFormation template comes in. Um, all of the configuration that needs to be done in AWS to allow the scanning and to allow the remediation uh, is now running in the background. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and refresh here. Um, it usually just takes a moment. So it's gone ahead and created that role. And what I need uh, from this process is this ARN number, which is now uh, unique to this, this stack and account. Um, and it, it will only allow <clears throat> Tripwire.io's AWS account to come in here for scanning. Um, now, before I uh, drop this in and create the account, since we do have to take you over into AWS to do that part, and the same is true for Azure, there's a, a quick start template we can use. We do have um, kind of a guided step through of what you'll expect from that interface here in Tripwire.io, just in case um, you know you're not sure what to grab. This shows that you you know copy that ARN out of the output tab and things like that. So once I drop that in, <clears throat> I've lost the uh, you know the instructions on what to do here. We're ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And 
So the account was created successfully. Uh, we have this little schedule a scan um, option that pops up in the snack bar. And that's going to drop me over into our scheduling here. Um, let's keep reusing this name. And I am going to scan just the account that I just created against the, uh, nope, against the AWS CIS policy. We can uh, do scans against the uh, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes service, but that requires some additional credentials. So for this demo, we're just going to look at the AWS CIS. And we'll just scan it now. Uh, we can scan it occurring daily. Uh, as granular as hourly. And so that's going to set up a new uh, scan here for my newly created demo account. So um, what we can see here is that that new, uh, that new scan is now added and it started to scan. So it's taking a look at the account I created. It usually takes a little less than a minute um, you do have the whole history of all the scans that took place against all of the other tests. Uh, myself and a bunch of other members of the team have accounts set up that we um, like to just check regularly, things that we um, like to test out here. So you have the whole history. You can drill into individual scans and um, take a look at the logs, things like that from this view. I am going to start us off in uh, an account. I'll do a little cooking show magic and uh, use one that I created ahead of time uh, to show you the results. But we'll come back and uh, look at that AWS. Oh, actually, no need for that. Um, this is the account that I just created. It looks like that scan finished. Let's go ahead and take a look. Yeah, so you can see that that scan finished in uh, a little under a minute there. So. This is uh, the account that I just created as compared against the CIS benchmark for Amazon Web Services. Um, this is uh, the CIS version 1.2.0. There's now 1.3.0, which includes a storage section, and that content is uh, coming soon here. We'll have that up and running pretty shortly. And it breaks it down into uh, the foundations really means what are the foundational aspects of your account that would need to be configured correctly, not counting the services underneath or the you know virtual machines or anything like that, just the account itself. Is it set up following best practices in a way that's going to keep you safe and that you know the services under that will be safe? So identity and access management is really about, you know, do you have this set up in a way that people can log into it correctly? Um, minimizing use of the default administrator account, things like that. Logging and monitoring is about making sure that you're making use of the visibility tools in the provider that would let you know, you know, if something critical changed, uh, would you have forensic data on that? Would you be alerted to that? And networking is really about making sure um, the, the right people and services can get into your account. Um, we're mainly looking at things here like you wouldn't want to have, you know, SSH or RDP access open to the world into this account. And um, the, the prioritized list of issues is over here on the right. These issues are individual um, failed checks against the benchmark. And uh, under the hood, we take a look at some of the operational impact of these misconfigurations, what type of configuration they are, uh, and what might happen if they were done incorrectly. And there's a few attributes of each check that are um, kind of written under the hood, and they add up to a risk score so the items with the highest risk score are at the top of the list, and then it gets lower as you go down. So this is that prioritized view. And if you only wanted to look at the ones that you could just uh, fix with the click of a button, you can limit your view to uh, issues that have our Fix Now button also. So that's just kind of a quick view of I know where, where I stand against the benchmark and, and can start getting to work right away. I'm going to drill into identity and access management here because I've intentionally misconfigured something that I know is pretty easy to uh, understand. As I drill into each section of the benchmark, um, we just update the description here, the list of issues, updates over on the right, again, in priority order. Um, but what I'd like to take a look at specifically 
is um, this ensure that the password policy has a minimum length of 14 or greater. That's also up here uh, in the graph that I can see with the hover over. And um, if I limit to issues with fix now, uh, you can see it over here as well. So let's go ahead and drill in on that. This is the failed check. If I go ahead and open up that particular check that failed, we have a description of uh, what's, what's happening here. The status, this requires remediation. We are able to automatically fix it. Now, if uh, you weren't comfortable with automated fixing or you needed to hand off the instructions for what to do to another team, things like that, we do have uh, remediation instructions where you can either take care of it uh, by logging into the AWS console, the management console directly and following these steps, or if you have another integration or prefer a scripted approach, uh, the AWS command line interface uh, will provide you the CLI command that would fix this as well, um, you know, just to give you those options there. Uh, we also have some more information about the output. In this case, it's a very simple check we are looking at the minimum password length value, and it's 13, which is not 14 or greater. So this one is failing the check here. And um, I like to use this example because the policy says it should be 14 or greater. And you, if it was 14, you'd be passing according to CIS, but there may be internal policies or other reasons why you know, your company uses 15, 16, 20, et cetera. Uh, those would all be passing values. So if you wanted to automate that remediation here, we just want to find out from you, what is the minimum password length that you'd like to use? We're going to default to 14. That's the one that will get you passing. Um, but you could go ahead and put in something greater than that, like 16, if you wanted. And if this is a setting that anytime we check, if this has gone out of compliance, we should set this back for you you can fix it automatically in the future. So anytime we run a scan, if this check is failing, we will run the remediation and get you set back to the minimum password length that you've defined here. Um, for now, I'm just gonna run the fix, uh, just do this manually. And so Configuration Manager is gonna go ahead and reach out to this AWS account that it scanned and try to issue the command to update that password length. Uh, once it sees that that command has been accepted, it's going to rescan that same um, that same value. Oh, let's see here. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that that worked there. We had a little graph update failure, but uh, the uh, check runs again after it sees that the command has gone through, and we pull back the minimum password length, and you can again see uh, the value is updated to 16. If I did fix automatically in the future, anytime we scan this account, we'll go ahead and bump that value back to what you set. And for AWS, we can do that for about a third of the items here. So um, that is kind of the power of Configuration Manager when it comes to making sure your account is following these prescriptive best practices. And again, this is for the umbrella, the account itself. Um, all of the things running under it, like the virtual machines, um, can be monitored you know, separately with other means. But this is really a way to look at, you know, for my AWS account, am I set up correctly? Am I doing the things that uh, the Amazon engineers who worked with the CIS community came up with as the most important things to check? Um, if I pop back over here to all accounts, I can show you uh, we also have some Azure uh, results. So this one um, has a lot more checks. Uh, let's see here. There's a lot more sections um, because they've included some of uh, the Azure engineers that worked with the CIS community had a few other things that they thought, you know, in our database services, there's a few things that you should make sure um, are being done in order to consider that done correctly. And that's not to say that each individual uh, database is set up correctly, but your database service is following these best practices, things like that. So it has a lot more sections, but you'll notice, you know, identity and access management, logging and monitoring, networking, the core things that you want to watch out for to make sure the right people have access, the right, you know, systems can access this remotely. And if anything critical changes, 
I'm watching the right things to know that that happened. And if something unexpected happened, I can go see, you know, the, the forensic data about that. And that's what this all kind of boils down to uh, in the foundation's benchmark. So that is how we compare a cloud account against a benchmark to let you know this is set up correctly. But there's a little bit more to it because, um, as you know, there are a lot of uh, cloud breaches that occur um, based on your storage, the public or private nature of your storage. So I'm going to go ahead and drill into um, the AWS storage monitoring dashboard to show you what that's about. Um, when you think about storage in the cloud, and when you read about it in a lot of the articles about something you know, where there was a breach, um, they will talk a lot about this was public or that was private. But there are a lot of attributes to your storage configuration that add up to the, you know, the publicness or privateness of that data. Um, so we can tell you there are two uh, buckets in your AWS account that are publicly available, and the other 48 are private. But what does that mean? Um, there are 23 of them that have the option checked for public access block. So whatever else is going on with them, whatever policies or encryptions you have set, we're just going to block public access to those. And that's what this tells us. You know, How many of them are encrypted or unencrypted uh, is another thing that you may want to check. And if we drill into any one of these things, like if I wanted to see just which one of my uh, buckets are unencrypted, um, I would click on that, and my filter would update down below, and I would see each of the buckets that uh, that fall into that category. Um, public policy is another way that you can manage uh, your your storage in AWS specifically, where you're looking at things like it might appear to be uh, you know world readable but uh, it's only actually accessible from this AWS account or this user. So if you wanted to take a look at um, situations where you had uh, a public policy created and you wanted to take a look at you know, the policy statement, you could drill into a lot of that information and see you know, exactly what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, and then we also have publicly world readable versus world writable. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with data being world readable. Like you may have an image on a website that you know anyone could load from their browser. Uh, so publicly world readable makes sense. Publicly world writable, however, is something where you might be a little bit more concerned. So this is just kind of the the high level attributes that tell the story of the publicness of your data, um, and we want to make sure that you have that visibility into it. Soon, uh, we're going to enable the ability to enforce on a per bucket basis. Um, that that public access block, so that if you know uh, there is a, a bucket with a set of data that should be under all circumstances private, and we check it and it does not appear to be anymore, we can go ahead and enforce that. That feature is not yet available, but uh, definitely should be by the end of the year. So I think um, as far as the uh, checking the state of your account to make sure it's secure. Uh, we have that uh, covered, and just making sure that your storage is as private as you uh, believe it should be, that's what uh, Configuration Manager can do for you here. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And at this point, I think we're shifting over to questions. Mitch? Sure, absolutely. Um, Thank you guys, I, you know, very well done. So the first question we have is, how can you do manage multiple cloud service providers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with Configuration Manager, uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen again here just to kind of demonstrate it. Um, you can set up, uh, we give you up to 100 accounts uh, for each bucket of licenses that you get. And in my environment here, um, let's see, jump right into my cloud accounts. Uh, each of these rows would be one of those accounts. So I have you know, several Azure accounts in here, several AWS accounts, some of them monitored in different ways. Um, so I can go to my cloud compliance dashboard 
And before I drill in anywhere, I can see, you know, here's my AWS, here's my Azure, um, and we, we will soon have Google available there as well. Uh, so within the same view, and then with the same ability to drill in and remediate things, uh, you can cover the major cloud providers. Excellent. The, thank you, Brent. The next question is, does Configuration Manager function as a managed service, or how, is, how, does, it, how does it function? So it is a SaaS offering. Uh, the way I was using it uh, would not be you know, managed service. That would be me going in there and uh, seeing my results and updating them myself. However, uh, it can be used in conjunction with Expert Ops, which is our uh, managed service offering where uh, you would have a managed services engineer who looks at these results and works with you to determine you know, what should change, uh, should any of this be automated, et cetera, and you know, uh, could, could go in and remediate things for you or generate the reports for you to let you know the state that you're in. So it is possible to use Configuration Manager as a managed service. Yeah, one of the pieces of logic that we're pursuing here is, you know, uh, along the lines of we don't have enough people that have enough expertise. If you feel like you need to augment that capability, uh, we, you know, we can apply people that are experts on uh, the technology that can do it for you. So, you know, that's part of the logic about what we've built here uh, uh, going forward. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, what if we want to monitor for change, but we don't want the security tool to have access to make changes to our cloud accounts? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, that is a concern that we have heard. I know that there are separations of duties in a lot of teams, um, and that's why we have that ability to decide, is this going to be a remediation account, or is this going to be a read-only account? Um, so in situations where you would want the security team to have the information when something changed, uh, to report on it, to give it to the teams that would be responsible for uh, taking care of that. You can have a read-only account. Um, that read-only account will still have all of the recommendations. Uh, you need to follow these steps to get into compliance, et cetera. Uh, that could be handed off elsewhere, but the tool itself uh, as read-only would not have the ability to make a change to your cloud account. Excellent. Um Thank you. Um, the other question that, that we have, and, and um, I guess there's more to this question as well, it's what cloud providers do you cover? And I guess the part two to that question is, is there any limitation for public, uh, private, hybrid community and so forth? We are covering, uh, before the end of the year, uh, we'll have AWS, uh, Azure, and uh, GCP all as part of uh, uh, the offering. Our, uh, at this moment, we are not currently, uh, we don't have anything on the roadmap for additional uh, uh, public cloud providers. Um, and we uh, will entertain any uh, thoughts about additional uh, 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 private clouds, but uh, that's not part of the current uh, roadmap. And the next question is, is the storage monitoring based on CIS benchmarks? That's a good question. Um, so the CIS benchmarks are really about looking at the foundational aspects of your uh, cloud account itself. Uh, in this situation, would it be best to say that your cloud account should be set up this way and should not be set up otherwise? Um, for storage, there's nothing inherently wrong with data being public. You may have data that should be public. Um, so there isn't really a way for uh, the community of, at the Center for Internet Security to say, um, here is how to make you know, this type of data public and this type of data private. What we have to give you there is visibility. Um, so it's not based on a benchmark. I, there isn't really a way to benchmark the publicness of data, um, but it's definitely uh, something that we since there are so many breaches based on that, we want to make sure that you have that visibility into your configuration. Okay. And the last question we have is, is it safe to automate remediation? Um, I think that that is kind of a, a multi-part question. Um, we do want to offer the ability to automate as often as possible. Um, so there are some checks that we'll do where there's decision-making that has to happen in the tree of uh, what you do to remediate that. So you can't really automate that as well. 
But in any case where we would say, like in the example from the demo, uh, the password blank should be 14 or greater, that's, a, that's one piece that we're checking. And if you wanted to change it, you could set the value that it would be. And if your playbook says, anytime our password length is determined to be out of compliance, set it to this. Um, when you have a person who has to log in and do that, especially a security expert, you're kind of taking them out of play for all the time that they have to spend uh, logging in and making the subtle changes. So if you have a playbook that runs the same way every time, um, you've set yourself up for a great opportunity for a computer to do that for you, uh, to keep your, your people who need to be making decisions and doing research uh, available for the more complicated problems. Uh, by the way, on one bit of logic about how we've approached this is we never want to make the assumption that we know how your network ought to be run. You know, there are some things sometimes where it's clear uh, you shouldn't do this. Uh, and, and so, you know, for instance, uh, if we know that you will get into trouble if we try to automate a function, then we won't allow the automation. Uh, we won't, we didn't create the automation for that uh, uh, capability. We create the op, uh, automation when we believe that a majority of customers would find it to be safe, but we don't force the automation because the decision has to be yours, you know, in your particular environment with your particular policies, this is a safe automation uh, to execute. So in that case, we give you the tool to allow you to do the automation, but we leave the judgment about whether or not it's safe to do it in your hands. So, Mitch, was that the Liz, last question? That's the that's the last question, Stephen. Liz, back to you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Well, I'd like to thank of everyone course. for attending today, and thank our presenters, Stephen and Brent, for your great presentation and demo. And thank you to Mitch for moderating. Uh, we do hope that you'll join us again for future webinars. Feel free to check out our website at www.tripwire.com for future events, and we really hope that you'll join us. So thank you again, everyone, uh, and we hope to see you soon. Have a great day. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.